Thank you, John. Um, and I also, again, want to thank the staff, Sh um, Shannon and the staff, for the wonderful job they did to put this together. I know what they had to do because I used to do it with the help of a lot less people. And this, I feel like I'm not at the camp out because I'm not stressed out or anything. I'm just enjoying talking to all the members. So thank you, Shannon, for such good organization. There's nothing there's need that I needed to do. Thank you. Um, well, tonight it's my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Frances Morla Pay. Uh, Frances started her work about the same time that Kent and I started our work with Seed Savers. Or you might have been doing it before, but the time and period I'm thinking about is 1971, the early 1970s. Um, Kent and I were homesteading in northern Missouri, and we were, our library was very limited. Um, we had um, the whole, whole Earth Catalog, the ball canning book, um, Helen and Scott Nearing's book, Living the Good Life, and Diet for a Small Planet. <laughs> and I must say, this, this um, as it says on the top, this book started a revolution in the way Americans eat. And I, I've heard that comment tonight that this book has changed so many people's lives. Um, but since then, Francis has been the author of 18 books, um, including, the, including this one. And she also, and her new one, EcoMind, is is a wonderful addition to her, to her work. Um, she's the co-founder of three organizations, including Food First, the Institute for Food and Development Policy, and more work for research and popular education seeking to bring to bring democracy to life, which she leads with her daughter Anna LePay. Um, it's just certainly my pleasure. I know that Frances does a lot of traveling, and we were so honored that she took time out from her schedule to be with us tonight. So it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Frances Morla Pay. This is fun. I've never given a talk in blue jeans before. <laughs> so, and I always wondered if I could give a talk without high heel shoes on, too. Uh, you know, that, that always gave me my sense of authority. So tonight, <laughs> let me see if I can just hook this. One advantage of blue jeans. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you, John and Diane and Shannon and Lonnie, who picked me up at the airport. And let me just make sure that I can move my slides and then I can begin. This photo, by the way, was taken by, by my daughter when we were just leaving a village, you will love this story, we were just leaving a, leaving a village in India which had hardly ever s met any Westerners <laughs> and we had just seen this hut that had these big Hindi letters written across it and we asked our interpreter, what does that mean? He said, oh, kind of nonchalantly, it just says Monsanto out of here, no GMOs. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he was just so casual about it, and here we were, you know, so far, so far, you see, and they were already on it, they were on it. So, I, I am totally delighted to be here, I've so been a fan for so many decades, and uh, I signed books today, and what I was moved to say to you all who I signed books to was just so great to be on this road with you, so... I uh, feel like, yeah, I can wear my jeans. So uh, I would like to start, though, th create the, the kind of the mantra of my talk is of all, from all <laughs> strange people uh, that I would choose is from D. Hawk, uh, the founder of Visa. But he said, listen to this, what he said, though. It's perfect. He said, it is far too late and things are far too bad for pessimism. Right? <laughs> That's the spirit. So despite uh, he may not be our icon, but there it is. He said it. Um, so here, here is my question to you. Usually I have a bunch of questions, but most of them are irrelevant to you guys. But the question I have for you that is really at the core of everything I'm talking about tonight is this. How many of you feel that you have a working theory? about how we got into the mess we're in. One that empowers you, guides you. Well, it's, a, it's quite a number, but it's still a minority of hands that went up. And here is my thesis. 
that if we don't have a working theory about how we got into this mess, it's very unlikely that we're going to get out. <laughs> and so I'd love to hear your theories, but I have the mic. So <laughs> you're going to hear my theory. And this is my theory. This is not the truth. This is my working hypothesis that gets me up in the morning. And so I've tried to go bam, bam, bam through this so that we'll have some time to talk. So here is the thing. I want to start where I began. Here is where I began. Let's see if this works. Ah, there I began. There I was, 1971, saying, huh? <laughs> I, um, this kid, I was 20, well, this is probably 69, 70. I was 26, 25, 26, and I had this intuition. If I could just understand why people are hungry in the world, that that would unlock the mysteries of economics and politics. That would, I was, a dir I was seeking direction. I was lost. I, well, anyway, that's a longer story about why I felt that way, but trust me, that was a seeker. <laughs> and I thought food could give me a handle, be the, be the opening, because what is more important? Nothing, you know, than for our species, or any species, than to feed itself. So I uh, began with that question, why hunger? And then I learned that uh, the question is not just why hunger, but why hunger in a world of plenty? And the question then kept growing. Why hunger in a world of plenty? And then, oh, wait, why have we turned food into a major world health hazard? Hmm, that's interesting. But then my questions kept growing. And by the 1990s, by the 1990s they uh, grew to this one. The biggest one I can think of to date is why are we together creating a world that not one of us as individuals would choose? Because I'm pretty sure you're like I am, that I've never met anyone, even the most callous among us, who gets up in the morning saying, yes, I want another child to die of hunger, right? Or yes, I want to heat the planet and destroy species. And yet, that's what we're doing. So it seems to me we have to have a working theory that helps us answer that question. And so, uh, as I say, here's mine. I came to the idea that in fact, um, that in fact, we human beings do not see the world as it is, but as we are. For many great teachers over time, I've come to see that the core challenge is that we see the world through a filter, through a culturally determined filter. We can't see what we don't expect to see. And I want to give you a really homey example of this. Last Thanksgiving, I was determined to get up early to make my favorite root vegetable dish because 33 people were going to be there by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I rushed to the cupboard to find my Dutch oven, and it wasn't there. I said, hmm, I, it's always there. No. So I looked in the another cupboard, another cupboard. I looked in the basement, and I got really frustrated. I finally gave up and started doing something else. I turned around, and there it was. Now, it had a plant in it. I couldn't see it, even though, as you will see, it is big and red. I couldn't see it because I was looking for a kitchen item, not a planter. So if we're looking for kitchen items when something, you know, looks more like a planter, we, it won't even register. And so that's my thesis, that this homey um, uh, example is that we are trapped. We hear this idea that seeing is believing, but I've come to this. No, believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. And so what do we believe? I'm suggesting that in this culture we, we come to believe one mindset. And it is a mindset that is what I call the scarcity mind. It is the idea of an absolute lack of everything. It's a lack of goods, whether it's food or energy or you name it, parking places in Boston certainly is my big challenge. Lack of everything and lack, lack of goods and lack of goodness in us. We absorb this idea that if you really boil human nature down to its essence, we are selfish little shoppers. Elbowing each other out in the giant mall somewhere, right? So this is what I'm saying is the mindset that we absorb unconsciously. This is the belief system that 
replicates itself because this is what we come to see. The scarcity mind I'm suggesting is made up of three parts. They're all intertwined. The idea that we are separate from one another and from the Earth's creatures and the Earth in general, that reality is stasis, is static, is stasis, is, is the second S, and as I've already said, scarcity. So the three S's define the scarcity mind, and, and it's a very, very scary premise of lack. Now, from this premise, um, since we don't trust ourselves, we believe that we are just these materialistic, competitive, um, and uh, pretty selfish people, then we distrust ourselves. Of course, we distrust democracy. Because what is democracy? It's the capacity to come together in common problem solving. And so that is the beginning of what I call then the spiral of powerlessness. Now, I should say from the beginning that my thesis that everything is based on tonight is that the solutions to our global problems, whether they be hunger or whether they be climate change or energy, that they're either known or they're just around the corner. When I think about food, for example, we know that we are taking tremendous abundance we are feeding a third of the world's grain to livestock. And even on the leftovers, we have 2,800 calories of food for every person on Earth every day. And yet, we have hunger greater than ever before. But my point is here that solutions are either known or just around the corner to all of these problems. And yet, we feel powerless to manifest them because we this mindset that I'm outlining. And so this, I call it the spiral of powerlessness, that what is lacking is our belief in ourselves that we can manifest the solutions to the problems that are global. So that this scarcity mind then starts with, as I've already said, this that there's not enough of anything, and certainly there's not enough goodness in us to carry out the democratic process. So we fall for this idea that we have to turn over our fate to others, to those experts up there, or better yet, to a magical force that kind of works on its own, an infallible force that Ronald Reagan called the magic of the market. But it's not any kind of market. Uh, it's not any kind of market. It is one kind. It is that driven by one rule. Every market has rules. Ours is one. Highest return to existing wealth. So wealth accrues to wealth accrues to wealth until we end up today where we have greater inequality than in Pakistan or Egypt. We have, the World Bank will celebrate, you know, that we've cut the poverty rate in half ahead of the millennial goals, but yet, if you exclude China, that there, the number of people living on less than $2 a day has actually increased by 29% since 1981. So we're living in a world in which 71% of us are living in countries where inequalities are increasing. So we start from the, the, the spiral of powerlessness we turn over our fate to a market that concentrates and concentrates and concentrates wealth, we end up with increasing inequalities, and that is just how it works. We were supposed to have learned this playing Monopoly. Actually, Monopoly was invented by a Quaker woman who wanted to teach us an object lesson about what would happen if we didn't set the rules to keep wealth circulating. And even with that, you know, that 200 when you pass go, it still ends up with one person in my household. It was my brother who ended up with all the property at the end of the night. Which was okay in a game because I got to go to bed. But then as an adult, I realized, wait, if we're all playing Monopoly, it's not that you go to bed at night. You don't have a bed. You're out in the street, right? That's how it works and greater and greater homelessness. So we didn't learn this, this great lesson that a market system only works if we step up to create the rules, if we believe in ourselves, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. So my point is then that um, 
the co wealth concentrates and concentrates and concentrates so that no matter how much food is produced, hunger increases. Just to give you one statistic I noted recently, that um, over the last five years, cereal production worldwide has grown twice as fast as population growth. And yet many of you know that we have greater hunger than, than ever before, close to a billion people in the last few years. Uh, we know that in our own country, the world's greatest exporter of agricultural products, and yet a half of our children, according to the University of Michigan researcher, half of all ch our children will be on food stamps at some point in their lives. So we can keep growing more and more and more, and yet have more hunger. That is the world that is created by this belief system that starts with lack and then ends up manifesting lack. So certainly we see that uh, as, as we have so dramatically with food in the last few years, where we've seen uh, starting with the food price spikes, but then going through, through 2011, the UN food price index was twice that of what it was in 2004, twice. So you, for what that means worldwide for people who are spending 70% of their income on food, it's no wonder then that hunger increases even though plenty of food exists. And, and so what I'm suggesting then is that this concentration of power then to continue around this spiral of powerlessness that infects and infuses our political system uh, so that decisions get distorted in the direction as we know now um, whether we're talking about fossil fuel subsidies that are now eight times greater than that for any kind of renewables, or whether we're talking about how our agricultural commodity subsidies operate to concentrate and concentrate wealth. So then that infusion of, of um, excuse me, yeah, the concentrated economic power distorts our political decision making. And so we end up then with greater suffering, and then what happens? Then we say, um, okay, um, look, we really are these selfish little critters, and it's a self-replicating cycle. Now, in terms of the power of economic uh, concentration to take hold of our political decision-making, many people have stated this very clearly, but I want to share with you one statement by a U.S. president who said it so clearly that I have tried to memorize this. The liberty of democracy is not safe if a people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than their democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. <coughs> now, I have to admit to you that I have not had the courage to use the F word, except when I'm quoting Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But it's, 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 it's really chilling, isn't it? Because isn't he describing the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than the democratic state itself, as we see now with billions and billions of private dollars going into our campaigns for president? So here is then the, the challenge then, is that we, this scarcity mind feeds on itself because then as, as we see what happens, say, on Wall Street where people did behave in a very selfish way, then we say, see, 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 that's human nature. You know, we really are these selfish critters and so it feeds on itself. And so this is my thesis then, is that we end up feeling powerless because we start with the premise of scarcity and we end up creating what we most fear. And so there, it's no surprise then uh, that depression is a leading global pandemic. And in fact, in eight years, the World uh, Health Organization is predicting that depression will be the leading disease burden contributor to the disease, leading contributor to the disease burden in the world. So this is no wonder because of the feelings of powerlessness, but it also can be explained by the fact that um, this spiral of powerlessness then leaves us fundamentally, I would say, perversely aligned with what we now know about the nature of nature and human nature. First of all, I think many of you would agree with me that human beings need at least three things. We need connection with one another as you're experiencing here. We need a feeling of 
power in our lives to make decisions, and uh, we need meaning in that. Uh, efficacy. So these are denied then by the spiral of powerlessness and uh, that I'm arguing tonight is perversely aligned with our true nature. And so here is another way that this scarcity mind is perversely aligned with our nature. It is this, that if you look at either the grand sweep or not so grand sweep of human history or you look at how we've shown up in lab experiments, when we've been experiment it on when we've been the guinea pigs, we will find that under certain conditions that not a few of us, but most of us will behave very brutally. So another way we can say that this mindset that leads to such concentrated power is malaligned with human nature is that um, it, leads to cons it leads to conditions that um, I'm saying that I think are pretty well shown to bring out the worst in us. The concentration of power I've mentioned. I've mentioned tra lack of transparency, of secrecy. Think about what happened on Wall Street. Do you know that one of the slogans of these folks on Wall Street was IBG, YBG, I'll be gone, you'll be gone, meaning that we'll be out of here with our millions before anybody really knows what's happening. Secrecy does not uh, bring out the best in us and neither does a culture of blame. And so what I'm suggesting tonight is that the scarcity mind then brings about the very conditions that have been proven throughout history as well as lab experiments to bring out the very worst in our nature. So now, how do we break free? I'm saying that you all are part of a global, this happening in cultures all over the world that are breaking out of this fear-based premise of scarcity and creating that which I've come to call an eco-mind that is based on a very different set of assumptions. And so the beautiful thing in the new science that's, un that's developing, one of the most exciting things, is they're discovering what they call neoplasticity, neuro, excuse me, neuroplasticity, where that they understand that we can actually wake up and see our mental maps and we can change ourselves by entertaining new thoughts and having new experiences such as you're having here. We can actually break free from our negative spirals. And so that is what is so exciting to me. And so we can move then from a scarcity mind to what I'm calling an eco mind, which Seed Savers is all about. Move to the three C's of connection, continuous change, and co-creation from the three S's to the three C's. This is what we are learning as the nature of nature and what is also true about us. And in this regard, um, I love, well, I've learned from so many people, but one, Dennis Noble at uh, Oxford University, a physiologist, he writes in a beautiful little book called The Music of Life, he said, in biological systems, there are no privileged components telling the rest what to do. Rather, there is a form of democracy in which all elements are shaping all other elements moment to moment. So, um, oops. Power source. Did I, did I unplug something? Did I? Help. <laughs> We're going to do this. Oh, thank you, thank you. I didn't know I, it's a problem. Okay, yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. So, so Dennis Nobel uh, writes that, you know, that we're, in other words, uh, that uh, there are, um, that we are each then, all organisms, all elements of an ecosystem, or including the human ecosystem, are co-creating moment to moment and shaping everything else. So think of the difference in the sense of power that an ecological worldview gives at every level of being. And my buddy, uh, physicist in Germany, Hans-Peter Durer, he once said to me, he just summed it up, he just said, Frankie, <clears throat> in biological systems, and in fact, in reality, there are no parts. If you understand an ecological worldview, there are no parts, there are only participants. <laughs> and so there we are. It's a huge, huge shift of understanding that opens up so many possibilities, um, so many possibilities for to let go of fear. And even from the scarcity mind, you know, even in, in environmental messages, which all of us are sharing with our friends, 
you know, even there, we can shift from an environmental message that is l trapped in the scarcity mind and move into that which is in the eco mind. What I mean is, for example, I've heard many, many times, oh, we've hit the limits of a finite earth, you know, oh, we've hit the limits. Well, when I hear that, what I think, oh, we've gone as far as nature can go. I guess we have to go with GMOs or geoengineering. You know, when you hear that scarcity idea, oh, we've hit the limits. So what I'm suggesting is that we let go of that languaging and those metaphors, and we shift from the frame of limits to what I'm talking about in an ecological worldview as alignment. That is, we align with nature as you all are doing, and we align with what is in human nature by being very clear about what brings out the best in us, then we can take a deep breath. There is enough. There's more than enough. We don't have to live with that fear. And, and I, I believe that then we also become much, much more creative. And we can move then into um, what we can start to reverse the spiral of, of scarcity by starting with a very different premise about our own nature. Sure, we can behave as selfish, materialistic, and competitive, but, and this is the other great thing about breakthroughs in science today, that actually some scientists call it a revolution in understanding human nature, that we are hypersocial, <laughs> that we evolved in tightly knit tribes, of course, in which to survive, to continue to get to where we are today. We, these, these six um, dimensions of ourselves, empathy, cooperation, a sense of fairness, a need for efficacy, for need for meaning, and our capacity for imagination, cooperation, and curiosity, these are all qualities that evolved in us, that right there to tap. In fact, um, on this, I'll come back to this in a moment, but how many of you have heard of mirror neurons, for example? A few of you have. This is, I love this. I even have a Google alert in my system for <laughs> mirror neurons, if you know what that means. Anyway, Im so mirror neurons mean that if I'm going like this up here on the stage, there are actually neurons in your brain that are firing as if you were doing this. Think about that power you have as people are watching you. We are actually experiencing each other a as, we, as we observe. And it means then that, of course, we're, we can't avoid being empathetic at one level because we're actually walking in each other's shoes. Cooperation. Do you know that at Emory University, when they looked at our brains through functional, FMR, functional MRIs, when we were cooperating or when we were competing, that when we were cooperating, that parts of our brains were stimulated, it was like eating chocolate. It was so pleasurable, right? But it makes sense because cooperation, that's what allowed the tribe to continue flourishing. So we, we start then from an eco mind with an understanding of our own of our own ecology of our tribal being and what then that brought about. And so then uh, we can begin to um, um, understand then what is necessary to bring out the best in us. Sorry, I'm just getting ahead of myself here. Um, so we can start then the spiral of empowerment. We can start with the premise, yes, if we create the right conditions, that we can begin to build on those six capacities I just mentioned and begin then to believe that we really can get money out of politics, yes, and that we are freed then, uh, we can actually have public decision making that is answering to us and we can set the rules that keep the market fair and open so that we can begin to meet our needs and are then reinforcing a very different view of our possibility and, and, and ground our lives in an honest hope, not one pie in the sky, but in our actual experience. And so that really is the, the key here. And of course, as I'm saying, that the key is this understanding that it all is about creating the conditions that bring out the best in us instead of the worst, which are the opposite of the ones I put up on the screen before. The conditions that are proven to bring out the best in us is the continuous dispersion of power, transparency. Actually, you know, they did a study of a, of a coffee uh, station in a university that was an honor system, right? Where everybody's supposed to put in money for their coffee and people weren't doing it, and somebody had the bright idea to put just 
a pair, a picture of human eyes above the coffee station. And people started paying for their coffee. So even the, even being reminded of somebody watching us, we do better. So, and, in, and replacing the blame game with mutual accountability. We can't just blame those bankers for what they did. Where were we? Where were we when if things got deregulated? Were we really on the job as citizens? So we can start then to see what are the, what are the possibilities that bring out the best in us. And that makes possible then the real challenge before us as we move into the, the embracing of possibility with an eco-mind is that we begin to imagine democracy in a whole new way. Uh, ecology of democracy is not something to do us or for us in Washington or anywhere else. It's a culture of mutual accountability that, that involves every aspect of our lives. And we can then see, you know, one of the things that, um, that um, my daughter and I realized uh, one night in rainy Seattle, we looked at each other and said, you know, being a drop in the bucket is not so bad. Actually, buckets really do fill up fast. It's being, we said, oh, but most people feel like they're drops in the Sahara Desert and they're evaporating before they hit the ground. So with this eco-mind understanding and ecological worldview, we can start to create a sense of possibility that becomes the bucket in which our individual drops can be building this shifting, now my metaphor, to the spiral of empowerment. And so that's really uh, the key to what I'm suggesting tonight. And it is then, uh, makes possible this shift from the scarcity mind of, as I've said earlier, hitting the limits of nature to aligning with the laws of nature. And that makes possible this, what I'm calling living democracy or ecology of democracy that is not what we have, but what we do. It is a practice it, that engages the best in us and pulls forth the deepest understanding of what human nature is really about. And in this, you're not gonna be surprised that I'm gonna come back to food because my youthful intuition from my mid-20s was that food and I didn't have the language then for it, but I did have the sense that food, because it connects us to one another, as we just ate that delicious food prepared by our, our, our friends here, it connects us to each other, it connects us to our own bodies, and it connects us to the earth. And therefore, it has a particular power for, to allow us to absorb an eco-mind or an ecological worldview in our bones, you know, literally in our bones. And so I suggest that, that I want to just, um, the rest of my talk, I just want to focus in then on that power of which you are part. And that, as I've just said, our, to our bodies, to each other, to the earth, and that therefore through food, there's not the only channel, but I believe through food and farming, we begin to let go of the scary, fixated, uh, quantity, uh, quantity, chemical fixated approach and realize that as farming aligns with the laws of nature uh, that is benign for the earth and us, that we can th meet our needs and all eat well. And so we can resist the fear. I, I was so struck by the head of the American Academy of Sciences who said, oh, if we all went organic, you know, half the world would starve, that sort of thing. And you, you read that all the time. And here was this very educated woman. Um, I have a story about her, in the, but I'll save that for the Q&A. Um, but um, the point is that we can then begin to tell the story of the ecological worldview through what is happening with food and agriculture here and around the world with particular effectiveness, I think, because food is one of the things that makes people most frightened when they think of scarcity, when they think of global climate change, uh, global climate chaos, I should say. And so we can get better and better at telling the stories of possibility as they relate to food and farming. How many of you are aware, for example, of the work of Jules Pretty in uh, the UK? Do you know his work on looking at what is the potential for organic and sustainable ag. Well, he did a study that I think it's worth all of us to memorize the numbers if I can. I just, he looked at, he looked at uh, 
ecological farming practices in 57 countries, uh, including almost a, a 13 million farmers on an area when you pull it all together, I just uh, compared it, it's as large as the state of California. If you pulled all this acreage together, it's in 57 countries over uh, a number of years. And he saw that uh, ecological agricultural practices was, were able to increase the average, depending on which kind of average you're looking at, from 64 to 79 percent overall. And many of the crops that were in these experiments were even much greater than that. Uh, we can look at the University of Michigan study. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, Catherine Badgley's work of 2007? It was this mega study, interdisciplinary, at the University of Michigan which concluded that even if the entire world went organic, we could increase food production by as much as 50%. So we can, again, take a deep breath and realize that as we align with nature, there's more than enough for all. And so I want to take us on a cup to a couple of places that are particularly meaningful to me right now. Niger, if you read the papers, listen to the news, you, you hear only about famine and disaster in the Sahel, and which includes Niger. And it is true, it is true, there's terrible, terrible famine and suffering. But there's also something else that has begun in southern Niger, which most of us have never heard of, which is incredibly uh, meaningful, um, a lesson filled. And that is that about 20 years ago, farmers in southern Niger uh, began to realize that trees were not a problem for farming. They could hold the earth in place. And the trees they chose, they many of them were nitrogen fixing and had fruit that they could eat and the leaves they could use for fodder. And that actually trees were enhancing their uh, food security and their incomes in a significant way. And so, before, under the French, the French had made them feel, oh, oh, you know, don't mess with these trees, they belong to the state, the French colonial government. And the government said, no, 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 now they're your trees. And that also shifted the mental map of the Niger farmers. And so, I don't know how many of you can read this number here, but Niger now has regreened, uh, the Nigerian farmers, small farmers, have regreened 12 and a half million acres, 200 million trees. This is not small potatoes, so to speak. Uh, this is significant. And during drought years, I was just reading uh, one of my informants there who travels there all the time. He was saying that in, in drought years where the crops aren't doing well, that the, the, the fruit and the fodder from these trees can provide significant income to enable the farmers to buy food. So it's, it's tremendous resilience built in here. And it is from this sense of letting go of the mental map of trees is a problem, trees is a po uh, property of the state, and recognizing that it can work with them. And now, another piece of the living democracy part is that farmers are actually developing bicycle patrols. So they're setting the rules for caring for the trees and stepping up to the challenge of making sure that the trees are cared for. And that's another part of, again, it's, it's we can behave in, in ways that are considered of one another, but yes, we human beings need rules to bring out the best in us, and that means we have to have the guts to enforce them. And that's what they're doing there as well, and teaching kids uh, how to, in the classroom, how to care for these trees. So that's just one example of this shift that is occurring that is largely invisible to most people. Um, I'm going to, in October, I'm headed to meet these women. This is in a state in India that has been called the pesticide capital of the world. This is Andhra Pradesh in India. It's a large southern state. It is a place that Monsanto has been pushing, pushing uh, GM cotton, and it's been a disaster for these folks. And about 10 years ago, it's only been about 10 years, they were so burdened by pesticide exposure illness and hospital uh, bills from that, and by the failure of GM cotton, and by the cost of the seeds and other, other inputs that chemical agriculture required, they began this process led by women. You see the, the women, those of you who can't see out there, the women have their hands outstretched. They are making a pledge to one another to move organic. Because if you're a small village and somebody's chemical and somebody's organic, that's not going to work. And so they have to go move together. 
And so they are pledging to protect the biodiversity and they are uh, and moving, you know, not overnight, but moving toward um, their own indigenous pesticides. There are now 108 <laughs> uh, potions that they've devised using their local materials to deal with, um, to deal with pests and they, their health is improving, and they say the food tastes a lot better. And a big part of this is they had become dependent on the subsidized white rice. And that was another reason they were ill, because they were getting this white rice from the central government. Now they're reclaiming their traditional crops. And over here is an elder woman selecting the seeds. And so seed sharing is a key part of this. And so about eight years ago, or maybe, well anyway, uh, not too long ago, they started what they call a, a, a seed festival with a caravan of dancers in a decorated carts that go from village to village. And they teach people about seed saving and sharing. And in February of this year, they went to 55 villages. It's starting out with just a handful, you know, maybe eight or 10 years ago, now thousands of people are coming out to these seed um, savers caravans. And so now, if you can't see the numbers here so small, it's 8,000 villages in Andhra Pradesh. And I gotta tell you one story I'm so excited about that I hope I get to meet this woman. 19-year-old farmer, she bet her husband um, that she said, honey, uh, not literally, but um, y let's divide up. We're gonna do half organic, and you do your half chemical, I'll do mine half organic, and then at the end of the season, we'll see who has the most profit. He said, okay, and then we'll, we'll just go whichever has the most profit, we'll do all our little, all our plot in that. And guess what? Her organic methods uh, were 50% more profitable than his chemical. And so she became, she became a local hero and was tapped by the state government to become an extension agent. And now, as of last spring, the rural department, Department of Rural Development, the Agriculture Department, has set the goal of 80% of this state going uh, toward this, they call it community-based, uh, community-managed sustainable agriculture. 80% uh, over the next 10 years. I mean, that's, so anyway, I wanna go there, I wanna meet these women, and uh, if any of you want to follow this more, I can, they've created, they learned how to make videos. They're illiterate women, they learned how to make videos. And you can see this amazing story of the failure of BT Cotton in, and, and then this direction that they've headed, and it's so inspiring. So that is an example. You know, when I read about these women, it just, it just, it, it changes me. It, you know, it just really makes me able to see the possibilities um, that, uh, that you all are definitely uh, part of creating. And so um, um, obviously then this, this example from Niger or India, it represents what you already know that small ecological farmers are also key, absolutely central to the dr uh, to solution to global climate chaos. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you go, you can just Google grain, G-R-A-I-N, grain, you know, the, the regular word. Uh, it's an organization though, in this case, in, um, in, um, in Spain, that, um, and if you, I, I, well, I'm, I'm blanking out right now on the forgotten link. If you, if you Google grain and the forgotten link, you can get to a, a major study that, that has done all of this combining of other studies and concluded that if you include every aspect of food and agriculture from burning of, of um, forests to you know, chemical fertilizer that it, there's about 57%, the largest figure I've ever heard, 57% of our climate crisis is related to, in some way to this massive food system of ours that is so unecological. But think of the possibilities. They say if we moved, if we took advantage of all the different aspects of uh, agroforestry, et cetera, et cetera, that then within, that if, if agriculture moved, that the possibilities within several decades that agriculture, uh, ec ec 
ecological agriculture could uh, uh, reduce by half the burden of global greenhouse gases. It's a fascinating uh, meta look at the contribution of, of food and farming to the problem, but then also, therefore, to the solution. But I want, before I close, to, to just get a lot more personal about what's required of us. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, I, I'm suggesting that we are in a, uh, an era in which we can now understand that it is not that we are so uh, callous and asocial, we are hypersocial creatures. We are so connected with one another that what is required is what I've, call, I've come to call, uh, <laughs> that I'm working on it myself, I'll put it very simply, I call it bold humility is what I'm working on. And what I mean by that is very simple, is that you know now from these six positive qualities that I mentioned earlier on the screen that, that I think human beings are good enough, right? We've got these soft wired into us incredibly powerful pro-social sensibilities. But having evolved in tightly knit tribes, we have one handicap as well. It's our social nature is our great virtue, but it's also a handicap. And here's what I mean. Because if the entire hyper tribe, or you know, if the if the bulk of the hyper tribe is heading over Victoria Falls, then we got to separate from the pack, right? But it's still going to bring up fear because we're so connected to one another. It's very hard to separate from the tribe, and really, that's what I mean by bold humility. It means rethinking both fear and power. And the other thing about the eco that the eco mind offers is that we have to expect surprises. As I love to say, the things that most inspire me today, I would never have predicted when I was my kid's age. And so I, that's a kind of humility that I'm talking about. Because with an eco mind, you, things are everything is connected, and you never know then what change is possible. So my sense is then that once we we reframe the problem not to make us better people, but where's our backbone? Where's our courage? Then, how, then what's possible? What's possible if we begin to work on that? And I'm suggesting that maybe we can come up with some sneaky uh, tricks. I'll tell you my little reframe that I use, and that is that for me, when I get really nervous about saying something or doing something that's not very uh, much with the dominant tribe, my my hand goes bump bump bump, my heart goes bump 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 like that. Well, uh, I decided to reframe that not as you wimp, which is what I used to think, but oh, that's just my inner applause speaking. <laughs> and so I I, I just got to tell you my inner applause moment recently. I went to Oxford, England to de to deliver petitions that I collected signatures which you can still sign uh, because Oxford published a book uh, without disclosing that the author was a consultant to Monsanto, a book that promotes uh, GMOs without divulging that the author, and I gotten, so you can see I had this pounding heart. Not one faculty would speak with me at Oxford, but I was able to deliver the petitions to the head of Oxford University Press, but I'm still on this case, and so I can tell you more about that. But the pounding heart, I said, oh, yes, I've got to do this. <laughs> it's my inner applause. Okay, so, so then we begin to think, okay, if we can, if we're good enough to make democracy possible, then we just need to work on our, that capacity to really go for it, then we can see the capacity for really building a living democracy movement that could bring together all of our distinct movements. It doesn't mean that we give up on, or we, you know, move away from any of our single issues, but with a frame and a dialogue about what we're, wh what we're capable of, to break out of the scarcity mind and into the ecological worldview, then we can see the possibility of a movement that could be pulling us all the diverse movements, whether it be against global poverty and hunger, or biodiversity issues, or climate chaos, you name it. And so we begin then to see that we can, the answers are there. The an we know how to get money out of politics. 
And this is the best kept secret in America. And the reason I put her face, her, her wonderful smile there, why is she smiling? Because she lives in the state of Maine, and in the year 2000, she was a waitress, a single mom, but she could run for office and win and become a distinguished legislator, legislator pa helping to pass terrific environmental legislation. Why? because of voluntary public financing. She does not, and 80% of the legislators in Maine don't listen to their corporate sponsors because they don't have corporate sponsors. They ran with, on a voluntary basis with public financing. This is now possible at the national level. It, 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 means, it means that there is legislation now pending that hasn't passed. And yes, we can demand of anyone that we're considering voting for, will they push this direction. We can't wait for a constitutional amendment to change things. We've got to make it possible now to get our, dem our political democracy back. And what that then makes possible is, um, is new forms of, I'm oh, sorry. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna, is, uh, I just wanna go with this, is new forms of, uh, sorry, my slides are out of order, I didn't realize, uh, new forms of political participation, not just in the Deb Simpson sense of running for office, that's foundational, but we see throughout the world what I'm calling citizens participating in decision making, whether it be citizens juries where random people uh, were selected to, de uh, farmers were selected to debate the future of farming in Mali, and they said no GMOs for one thing, but that power of, of deliberation is so critical, or whether it be um, in, in India where 10 million families are involved in, in managing their forests that was devolved from the central government. So we can begin to see then new forms of political, of political uh, decision making. We also then can begin to imagine the idea of political parties really answering to us. And I put up this slide from Brazil Fome Zero, because that's what they did in Brazil. They started in the 1980s, building a party responsible to the workers, and guess what happened? They were able to elect a president that put zero hunger as the primary goal and have drastically reduced infant mortality in Brazil. In this uh, city that Anna and I visited, um, we saw some of the beneficiaries, these children, in the city, 60% reduction in, in child death uh, having to do with food as a human right that was then made a national campaign, that zero hunger campaign. And uh, so what I'm suggesting then, in addition, that we begin to, once we begin to see this possibility of a truly living democracy, we realize that it's not just about politics, it's also about economic life. It's about cooperatives, and that worldwide more people are members of co-ops than own shares in publicly traded companies. Who know? Who knew that? Uh, it's, 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 it's possible then to begin to bring our parts of our lives together, as many of you already are, who are involved very much where your economic life is not separate from your values, and it has elements of this uh, empowerment built into it as co-ops do. So that is another feature. And so what I'm suggesting then is that um, we can move from this spiral of powerlessness, from the premise of scarcity, and the cycle of empowerment as we begin to appreciate the pro-social qualities in us, in us and begin to work on our courage. And how do we work on our courage? Now that we know the, the mirror neurons, a key part of it is who do we bring into our lives? Are they people more risk takers than we are? And if not, why not? And how do we read the stories of possibility, whether it be in Yes Magazine or Solutions Magazine? And every day bring stories of courage into our lives. And as I say, bring people more courageous than we into our lives and marry them if we can. That's the best. Uh, but in other words, um, we can take charge of our own backbone development as we recognize ourselves as part of this social eco ecosystem where every organism is shaped by every other organism. And we realize too the power of uh, that a University of Virginia study put uh, students in two groups at the foot of a hill 
And one group had a backpack, he, oh, both groups had heavy backpacks on, right? And they were looking at this hill. The only difference between the two groups is one group had a friend by their side and the other people in the other group did not. And you've probably guessed it. People who had a friend by their side saw the steepness of the hill much less daunting, <laughs> much less steep than those who had no friend. And the longer they had known this person, the less daunting the challenge seemed. So the kinds of, of groups that you are part of here in this, this multi-decade history of seed savers is part of that creating those friends that make the, 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 um, the hill seem less daunting. And so in my case, uh, it's really, really helped me. It's really, really helped me to, to have a lodestar to have one person who I carry with me all of the time as a symbol, a lodestar of courage. And I put this beautiful face of Wangari Mathai. We lost her almost a year ago. But think about this. When you think about the challenges that we are all part of. On Earth Day in 1977, Wangari Mathai planted seven trees in honor of seven environmental leaders. And she was mocked by her husband who thought it was too messy to have these tree planting going on in the patio. But she also then began to see, wait a minute, we have to, we have to not just plant seven trees, we have to reforest our country because the desert is encroaching and it's gonna take village women all over Kenya to do this. So she went to the foresters and they laughed at her and they said, what are you talking about? It takes foresters to plant trees. And she said, no, 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 I think if women can grow corn, they can plant trees. And so she went to the villagers and just said, try it. If that doesn't work, try something else. What happened? Those seven trees became 45 million trees in Kenya. 45 million trees. And then she got the call from the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. And when she was a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, she had the standing to hook up with the UN Environmental Program. And together they came up with this idea of a plant for the planet. Have you heard of plant for the planet? The goal set in 2007 was to plant a billion trees a year globally. And when I heard that, I thought, oh gosh, that's so ambitious. Oh, I hope they're not too disappointed. Well, that was 2007. And today is 2012, and guess where we are? 11 billion trees. So I like to think of it, if you don't mind, <laughs> this bit of a, you know, poetic license here, but still. Wangari started with seven trees. Those seven trees became 11 billion trees. So what really helps me is constantly to be asking myself, what are my seven trees? What are our seven trees? And, and the, the lesson for me also is this idea that it is really not possible then to know what's possible and that that is the essence of the ecological mind. That we can't ever say, no, 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 that cannot happen. Because change is, is continuous, everything is connected, we're all co-creators. And so I would just like to share this final thought with you and then maybe a poem if I can remember it. <laughs> And that is that uh, the challenge right now is not to deny the fear that, that you know, is ambient in our culture or even get over it. It is to learn to walk with it, with our buddies, right? Just keep walking with it and to realize the power that is ours. And what is your power? And if I can be so <laughs> bold as to suggest that I think your power is who you are. You have what everyone wants. You have meaning, you have purpose, and you have buddies by your side. And so I just ask you to glory in that power, to feel it. And I bless you for it. And I would just like to end with a poem of Denise Levertov that says everything I've been trying to say, but better, short poem. We have only begun to love the earth. We have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How can desire fail? We have only begun. We have only begun to imagine how it might be to live as sibling with beast and flower, no longer as oppressor. We have only begun to envision what it might be to discover the power that is ours. 
if we would but join our solitudes in the communion of struggle. So much is unfolding that must complete its gesture. So much is in bud. Thank you for who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.